Everyone loves real estate stories, but not everyone knows how wild and crazy it can be. Want to know what actually goes down when trying to close a deal? You're in luck because you're listening to Real Estate Real Laughs, hosted by Valerie Fitzgerald and Bob Hurwitz. Get a good dose of stories and laughter from industry experts who have seen and done it all. Get behind the scenes and be privy to the high-end luxury market. Enjoy refreshing takes from fellow industry insiders and celebrities. Tune in and get a front row ticket to the unseen and hilarious side of real estate with Valerie Fitzgerald and Bob Hurwitz. So here we are back with Real Estate Real Laughs. So we've got some great laughs today because we're going to talk about sellers. I'm Valerie Fitzgerald and I'm Bob Hurwitz. Hey, Bob. <laughs> great to be here. I know it's great to be here again with you. Yeah, it's back together again. And, you know, I was laughing last night thinking about some crazy seller stories. And I remember one, and this was an amazing house in Santa Monica. And we're showing it, and the seller supposedly had left. We didn't know that he was still there and he, he had left. So as we're walking to the back, there was this really beautiful pool house. So we went to open the door and it seemed like it was stuck. So we pull on the door, pull on the door really hard. It pulls open and the owner is sitting on the toilet with his pants at his ankles. <laughs> <laughs> this <is> classic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, what do you say to that? <laughs> uh, not much. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of embarrassing situations that can occur. You know, I had this one, one funny thing I had was years ago out in Malibu with this guy who he was a big property in Malibu, was a big horse property. And the guy always insisted on playing this violin music from, he had a Stradivarius and it was horrible. I mean, just, but he'd always insisted that DVD or whatever it was, or CD had to be playing music. And one time I was showing a guy from Nine Inch Nails, I forget his name, a rock guy, you know? Right, right, yeah. Not exactly Stradivarius. No, no. And we go in and the music is like playing really loud. I thought the owner was like gone, just like you did, you know? And I, the guy was irritated with the music. And so I went and I like turned it off and I showed this guy from Nine Inch Nails the uh, property. And then the owner comes out. He was like about three feet tall too. He's a real irritating guy with a Napoleon complex. But he comes out and he goes, well, why did you turn off that music? I go, well, first of all, where were you? Like in a cupboard or something? Because I didn't know where it was. He goes, that music needs to be playing. I said, look it, I'm selling your house, not your <laughs> CD. Okay. And the guy hated the music. Anyways, never sold the house. <laughs> it's, like, it's weird. Like, you know, sellers, finds they, they forget what we're there for, which is to sell the property. Yeah. Sometimes they really insist on, on certain things that set up a, uh, the way they want you to show the house. Right. Um, they used to have me park my Bentley right in front. So people had to walk around the car to go to the front door. You know, that, that whole, you know, there was a whole moment there where, where brokers had to have these fabulous cars and they'd have to pull them up and leave them right in front to make it look more important. And gosh, I had this one seller. She was, she was wild. And we were doing our show on, on uh, HGTV, the selling LA. And I had this house and she, when I met with her, she was insisting that I do the Sunday open houses. And I told her that at this stage of my career, I don't do Sunday open houses, right. but, but, <laughs> but I have a team that does them and they're great at it. And, you know, there was, we were looking for the result, right? And people don't, I, I would say to her, nobody knows that I am sitting there. Nobody knows when they, when they're thinking of going to an open house. So we had the open house and all that. And I actually ended up not that from that, but getting her an offer. And she came into my office and I presented the offer to her. And it was very close to the asking. I mean, it was 150 off the asking price of like 3995. I think the offer was like 3825. And she looked at me across the table and she said, If I hurt, you're gonna hurt. You have to cut your commission. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. Some of the rationale, it's, and it is interesting because a lot of people will think they know. I mean, they're hiring you because they think you are the most highly skilled person. And the fact is the skill of the agent will make the difference between you know, potentially millions of dollars. I mean, you know this as well as I do. There's deal maker agents and there's the ones that really aren't. And, but it is interesting to me that sometimes 
a lot of times sellers will try and tell you how to do your job. And they're always wrong. I had one guy, and I, you know this guy too. I won't say his name because I think you might have had this listing too. Neither one of us actually sold it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It was up on Sunset Plaza. Okay. And it was also backed up to Viewmont. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the guy, I told this guy when I first met him, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because you did have it before me. Oh, wait a minute. Goes, I brought him $11 million and he told me okay. to go to hell. He told me to go to hell. He was listed at 14 and I said, at 13, nine. And I said, that is too much money. So I brought him $11 million. And he told me to go. He screamed at me. Right. That, well, that's his thing. He actually strangled another agent. <laughs> Honest to God. He jumped over the table and strangled. But that guy, he said, I said, look, here's the thing. First of all, you had it right before me and then people had it after me. But he said, this is what Valerie did on the house. And he showed me this really cool booklet and brochure and stuff, you know, because you do like really cool stuff. I go, well, that's great. Okay. I'm not really going to do that because you know, I do things a little <laughs> bit differently as well. It looks really good. I go, it's, I'm glad you like it. Okay. But the house, it didn't sell. Let, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. And I go, here's the thing. You can never be here when I show the property. He goes, well, what do you mean? I go, no, you can never be here. I will not take the listing with any owner that insists on being at the house during the showing. By the way, I remember him being at every single showing, showing the house himself. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so here's what happened. So I told him, I said, no, hey, here's the thing. I am not going to take the listing if you're here. And he goes, okay, I won't be here. Very first showing. I didn't know if he was there or not. I mean, I went in, didn't see him, or he disappeared or whatever. And I'm showing, and all of a sudden, he comes out in the middle of my showing and starts telling them things, like interrupting me, saying, hey, he's not showing it properly. And I was like, look at this guy. You know, you and I are very similar in the sense we've been doing this for a long time. We really do not take a lot of shit from people if we know the proper way to do things. And I was like in disbelief. And the people were kind of embarrassed. He was like, no, Bob's showing it wrong. You need to show it this way. And when we were done, they left. And, I, and he had that little office there when you came in the entrance. I said, never, ever, ever interrupt me in the middle of a showing ever again, ever. You just, it just isn't going to happen. You're never going to. And the guy was kind of taken aback. I said, just, it's never happening again. Those people will never buy your house. Flash forward, I have a broker's open. One broker's open is typical. People come through. The next week, I'm down in San Diego showing another listing. I get a call from him and he goes, where's the broker's open? I go, it was last week. He goes, you said you'd have a broker's open every Tuesday. I go, are you on crack? I go, why would I have a broker's open every Tuesday? Anyway, the guy was nuts. So a lot of these people think they know. But how to wait, run. you know what happened? He got foreclosed. Yes, He got exactly. foreclosed. Yes. And he lost it. Yeah. Yeah. All that control, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's oh a cook. God. Let me ask you, what was, the, what was one of the stranger ways that you got a listing? Can you think of something unusual? Oh, yeah. I had to, I think I told you, I had to fly up to Sacramento and see a, a, a concert I normally would never go to. Oh, right, right, right. Or I, I had to go there in my little suit and the, guy, they, the guys with their, what are those little t-shirts with the cans on their sitting on the horns on their hat and they're drinking beer from the can right right from sitting in their hat on their head. I mean, that was a pretty unusual experience. <laughs> I had to go. That is weird. Yeah. There's, I mean, I think if you go on enough appointments, you're going to get a lot of weird stuff. I was trying to think of some, maybe some interesting things. One of the more bizarre things that ever happened to me was, and it was funny because the reason I brought it to mind is I drove by yesterday, show a and I see the house is torn down. This was this was many, many years ago, but kind of an interesting thing. I, I got a call on this property. It was on the corner of Beverly Glen and Sunset, which is now just a, a lot. And I went in and the woman was like old. She was, she, was, she was pretty old. I was probably about maybe late 20s. And I went in and this woman was probably like 70 or something. And she was like looking at me really weird as we're going through the house. And the house had all these like dark curtains and kind of weird stuff. And she was like looking at me. And all of a sudden, she brought her hand up to my face, and, <laughs> which was kind of bizarre, you know? Yeah. And she goes, you look just like him. And I knew him. Just like that. I knew. And I'm thinking, what the hell? <laughs> she goes, I used to have a thin mustache. Too. She goes, it, you look like Errol Flynn. I used to know him. <laughs> and I go, really? I go, she goes, Come Who, who's Errol Flynn? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she takes me into this room where there's a piano and a bunch of other stuff. And I swear to God, Valerie, this to me is really interesting because you really never can get the measure of someone. We have a tendency to look at someone and figure out what, you know, where they're at or what they're about. And she showed me these pictures that were black and white from like the 40s and stuff. And she was proper beautiful back in the day. And she really did know him. 
And it was the weirdest thing. I would, I thought she was psycho. I did list the property and I never sold it and ended up getting torn down by somebody else. But it's just the weirdest thing how sometimes you blunder into things that you just go with the flow. You know, it's like I looked at pictures later on. I go, well, maybe a little bit back in the day. So I had um, this really well-known ac- older actor and he passed away and his wife, who's just zany as ever, they had a house, the Palisades and the Palisades, a big, big Mediterranean home. And so I had to go and sit with her for one hour, three days a week, while she would tell me stories about movies and people and friends and photos and all that. Because she said to me, she had to trust me. She had that I had to know something about her life and all this stuff. So I did that, I think for two weeks, I actually went there. I mean, this was back in the day, you know, also. So, and I was an $8 million listing at the time. So it was a lot of money to me. And, you know, so I went and spent an hour there. And, and it was actually interesting, but it was pretty tedious because she was in her late 80s and repeating herself. And she kept the room extremely hot. So I was like <laughs> dying, dying in the room. But uh, yeah, that was quite, and when, he, when she passed, when they all passed away, I ended up going to their funeral and seeing the family. But yeah. It's, yeah, you do get some unusual requests and unusual things. And um, I had one guy went on a listing appointment and he had a four-year-old. And for some reason, nobody could be around the four-year-old. So he kept the four-year-old and he would, he'd be home. He had to be home. And he would take the four-year-old back into the guest house, pull down the drapes and the curtains. God knows why, but nobody could see or be around the four-year-old. And then you'd walk through the house and he, then you'd have to text him and tell him you left and then he'd come out. But people have quirks. People have really interesting, we get so close to people's personal lives and how they think and the quirkiness that they have and the way that they live and they're, no, oh, show the house this way. And you're right. It's, you really, I, because homes tell a story, right? So you show them to tell the story and we're telling the story as we're showing it, walking through. So it makes sense to the person who's listening and walking, you're walking through with. So, you know, when they say, no, 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 show the, show the, you know, oh, I love my favorite thing is when they, when they go, well, where's the guest bathroom? And I say, well, I don't take pictures of toilets. And they, they, they go, tell, tell me, but I want my guest bathroom picture. I go, but it's small and there's the toilet. You know, so. Right. Because the truth is, I mean, less is more. I had this one guy's house listed. And he had the weirdest artwork of all time. And this one sculpture thing would just freak people out. It looked like kind of really like uh, macabre, kind of like really devilish. And I would just turn it around and hide it in the corner. But, you know, he was really proud of it. So the thing is, sometimes those quirks they think are really are, are good are real negative. And it's really about big picture, that first impression. They come in the door. It's like people, I have a client right now that is so meticulous and spends a fortune on everything from hinges to air, you know, air conditioning returns. And people don't care about that. They want to walk in and they want to really feel the house, but he thinks that's important. That may help us establish some value later on once somebody likes the house, but it's really strange. And you know, what if, I had this guy once in Malibu, this is funny, him and his wife, I go on this listing, really, really nice couple. And I go, so where are you guys going to go when I sell the house? He was another guy that wanted to be there for the showings. I said, no, I, dude, I don't do that. Okay. Well, the previous agent, I said, no, I'm sorry. I won't do that. So, okay. So I said, where are you guys going? And he goes, well, we're going to move to New Zealand. I go, really? Yeah. We're going to New Zealand and we're going to raise um, llamas or something. And I go, well, okay, that's interesting. And the guy goes, so we're going through the listing agreement, everything. So it's a cool house. It wasn't that much. It's maybe 3 million bucks or something. And he goes, he's looking at the contract. He goes, well, this part of the listing agreement says, if the property is made unmarketable, I still have to pay commission. What does that mean? I go, look, why don't you just tell me what the story is? <laughs> right. okay, I've never actually enforced that clause. I mean, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, if the IRS seizes the house, do we still have to pay a commission? I go, no, but I mean, why? Tell, you know, just tell me the story. I'm your advocate. I'm not your adversary in this, you know? I said, well, we're Dellionaires. I guess when Dell computer, some people made a bunch of money and they didn't pay taxes. I think if, even if you got the gain, but you did not get your money, you would still owe to, anyway. So he goes, that's why we're going to New Zealand because it's a non-reciprocal country and um, you know, they can't get us. Anyway, the IRS, the IRS did seize his house as it turned out. But it's interesting the way people, you know, at the end of a conversation, 
it's almost like even in like talk radio, people will talk a certain way. At the very end, they say what they really think, which is, and that was the same thing. But it's so important that we really understand, especially if there's an issue there, because the timing can be critical to them. Let's say for, whether it's foreclosure or whether it's being, there's something's being seized, or I mean, I even in divorces, how about where, where a couple stay, this, the husband and wife stay in the house, but then they're divorcing and they're battling, you know, and you have to try and show the house and get, you know, get in and do, I mean, it's, I mean, there's all, we have to know the story in order to put that front up for them. So, cause we're, cause we're the front for them to get them the highest, best possible price. And that, that's so true. And, you know, it's interesting because divorce fuels so much of our business. It really does. And it's kind of like a minefield, you know, you have to, one of the things I'm personally proud of is I deal a lot with divorce situations. I get along with both people. I mean, you really have to walk that line. And sometimes they're what they want to do. One person wants to do is different than the other, but it is important that they tell us a story and they tell it to us early enough. I'm sure you've had the this situation like I've had before where someone is very, they act like they don't really, not really motivated to sell. You know, whatever information they give us, that's how we operate. We're their representatives. And then, I mean, I've had this situation a number of times, one in particular for someone that's really a, a good friend of mine now. I'd bring offers and he and his wife would just kind of like scoff at him. And then finally, he said, hey, Bob, can we go to breakfast? I go, yeah, so go to breakfast. He goes, we're in trouble. Oh, for, for the wife would say, oh, we're not in trouble. Okay. And then you go, we're in trouble. I got like a month to get rid of this. And as soon as he did that, then I changed exactly my approach. And I sold the thing with multiple offers, very creative. And the guy's worth about a hundred million now. But without that, if they would have gone into bankruptcy, it would have been brutal because he's not a young guy. Yeah. I went on a listing appointment actually last week. And the guy said to me, um, you know, and, and the house was, I'm, oh my God, it needed so much work. So it, it was going to be a fixer kind of type of sale. He's like, well, you know, and, and pretending as though he didn't really need to sell, but he wanted to sell. He'd been there a long time and had to explain every little thing he did that he did to this house over 30 years, of which nothing mattered anymore because the house is a teardown. But in any event, Ned didn't tell me the truth. And I found out later that he owed in hard money $5.8 million. And I don't think the house is even worth $5 million. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's tough. So we had to part amicably and he found someone else, you know, who's going to take it. I'm sure has blown some smoke at him. That's going to be 10 million, but you know, the poor guy will lose the house because we know that happens with hard money loans. You can't, you're, you're borrowing more and more and more to pay back the debt that you can't pay back. Well, exactly. Yeah. It's interesting for my standpoint, because I deal with a lot of properties that are overseas and properties I don't see. It's really can be interesting. Some of the people you deal with, you know, they're, they can be like really kind of sketchy or you kind of kind of figure out if they really are who they're supposed to be, if they really own the properties. It's a lot cleaner here with the stuff we we deal here, but whew, there's some very, you know, unusual characters. But it makes it it makes it interesting. It's the people it that make it interesting. Absolutely, because every single day is a different deal, a different story, a different person, a different agent, a, you know, a different buyer and seller. It's all about the stories. Everybody's got a story. Everything has a story, and it just keeps it so entertaining. And you know, and, and as long as that there's some people that get, I see they get so burnt out agents because they take everything so personally and they get so crushed with it. But instead of we're problem solvers, we have to figure out. We got to hey, give me the story and let me help you together. Let's figure this out. That's exactly right. And. You know, I think it's really interesting because I tell my own agents this is like they'll be overwhelmed because they'll look too far ahead in the deal. There's one issue that came up. You deal with that one issue. Don't think so far ahead, but you have to stay ahead of the game. That's why it's important that there be an honest communication between the seller and the agent. But I do think certain agents, they get an adversarial position. They think their job is to protect. Agents that are good, that, you know, this business is psychology more than anything else. Just a matter of managing the expectations of your buyer, your seller, working with the other agent to solve the problems because everybody wins when the property sells. Well, 100%. But as we know, there are agents that, that think they're protecting their seller by behaving like they are the seller. <laughs> exactly. That is the worst. It's the worst. I mean, it's, it's so true. And what they're doing is, is detrimental to the seller. They, they really are. It's like, you've got to work 
we have to be the intermediaries. We're the ones that solve the problems, like you said. But if we don't know the problems, you know, we can't really solve the problem. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. I know. Well, Bob, I love talking to you about all of our crazy business. We have so much fun. fun, We do. Like I said, we could do this forever. I mean, there's a million. We do this totally extemporaneously. There's no planning. There's just a million different stories in this world that are just, it's not like the phony TV stuff where things are created. These are, this is real world issues. We've been in a long time. So I, I love talking to you as well. Yeah, I love it. And this is our real estate, real laughs. And we're going to come up with a, another storyline. And could we maybe do this next week? Let's do it. I All love right. It. It's fun. All, right. All right. Cool. Okay. I'll talk to you later, Bob. Have a great one. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Real Estate Real Laughs with Valerie Fitzgerald and Bob Hurwitz. Enjoyed the show? Then head on to ValerieFitzgerald.com and TheHJC.com. This episode's show notes and more fun episodes. Join us again for real fun and a lot of laughs here on Real Estate Real Laughs.